Welcome everyone. We are so glad you're here. I know we can't see you, but we're very excited to start this event today. I am Brittany. I am the chair of YWIB Seattle, Young Women in Bio Seattle chapter. And thank you for tuning in to our first virtual presentation. These online resources are available through our new YWIB online platform, which provides young people across the United States and in Canada free access to our educational and leadership programs and other opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and math. Why I was launching this new initiative for young people who are curious about STEM and want to learn more but may not live near one of our 13 YWIB chapters in cities across the United States and in Montreal. Young, young Women in Bio gives students today the inspiration and support they need to become tomorrow's leaders in science, technology, engineering, and math. We strive to provide education and hands-on experiences in STEM, as well as our passion for all scientific fields. YWIP Online provides students who cannot otherwise attend our events and programs with access to online programming in STEM. And this helps us with our goal to ignite curiosity and to inspire young people to see a future for themselves in STEM. We believe that by making these online resources available to a broader audience of students, we can encourage more people to find a lifelong passion and career in STEM. YWeb partners with leading companies, universities, hospitals, and other organizations to host engaging educational and motivational programs for students interested in STEM. And in fact, in one year, we had more than 70 events across North America, reaching more than 4,500 students and had the support of over 250 volunteers. YWeb has 13 chapters currently across the United States and in Canada. To learn more about those chapters, you can visit womeninbio.org slash YWIB. And I am so excited today to introduce our speakers for this event. First up, we have Melissa McCullough, a retired senior sustainability advisor, Yuli Fuentes Medel, project manager and research advisor for fiber technologies at MIT, and advisor for Closed Loop Partners and founder of DScience and Amy Olson, Laboratory Specialist and Research Technician at the Seattle Aquarium. Melissa is going to be our first speaker today, focusing on the broad topic of sustainability. And later on in our talks, we'll get more into sustainable fashion and what you can do to help the future of sustainable fashion. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Melissa, to get us started. And uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Oh, wait, help, help, help. I can also keep sharing for your okay, slides. Okay, there we go. I'm so sorry. I had it here just a moment ago. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, as Brittany was just saying, I'm, I, my specialty is sustainability, and I'm going to talk a little bit about today um, why sustainability is about the big picture and the long view. Um, when we first started making things, um, aside from when we started creating things, when we started the Industrial Revolution, when we started the, the uh, Better Living Through Chemistry age, um, one of the things that people did was they just sort of disposed of things. They threw it away, they piped it into a river, they put it out of a stack. And what we discovered was um, they had this theory that uh, dilution is the solution to pollution. Sadly, um, you end up that way with, if you overload it, you end up um, ending up with hot spots or just overwhelming the system. And you end up discovering that uh, dilution is in fact not the solution to pollution. And we are not seeing that just in the distance past. Um, when China started really ramping up their economy, they didn't control their air pollution either. And this is a mask, uh, mask times in, in Beijing far before uh, COVID came about. One way to look at the kind of impact that you have on the planet is to look at your ecological footprint. And an ecological footprint is really looking at how you live and how that impacts the planet and what kind of resources you're taking from the planet. So an ecological footprint 
looks at the, the um, kind of ways that you get around, what kind of food you eat, um, where do you get that food, what kind of house do you live in or, or apartment or whatever, and what kind of goods and services you use. And so that's a really important one for today's discussion. Um, if everybody lived like the United States did, we would need five to six planets um, in order to provide the resources that we have. The US is 5% of the global population, but we use 25% of the resources. We emit 25% of the greenhouse gases, which is a good bit more than our fair share. And 90% of what we buy is thrown out within a year. And I say out in quotes because it really doesn't go anywhere. It goes into usually a landfill where it, it um, will leach or just stay for a problem for another day. Sustainability is often spoken of as a three-legged stool where you have to balance economy, social equity, and the environment. But really, that's not functionally how it works. An economy cannot exist um, and be a vital economy and a vibrant economy um, unless it has a society within which it can, it can exist and it has to be a, a stable society. Um, and that society needs to exist within an environment that will support it. And that's because we depend on ecosystem services that the planet gives us. Some of these are very invisible. Things like um, the amount of water that's here on this planet is the same amount of water that's always been here. And it's just constantly recycled by evaporation and rain. Um, we have soil, which is a, a, a very vibrant multitudes of, of species in the soil of plants and animals, which create a healthy soil to create the food that we need. We've got pollinators, we've got uh, food webs in the ocean, all sorts of great um, resources that give us what we need to survive. A good example of this is this simplified food web for the Northwest Atlantic. And you see this is a very complicated food web, all of which sort of revolves around the fact that we want cod and pollock to harvest and uh, make our fish and chips and our, our fish sticks and our fish fillet sandwiches. Um, John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And, and that is very true. And what you find is that when you disrupt one part of the ecosystem, say down here at the bottom of this food web with the, with the plankton, you end up having those effects cascading and end up making a difference in the, the very resources that you need, which are the cod, even though they don't directly eat the plankton. And so there is these cascading events, which is why you need to look at the big picture. You need to look at the system. And, and the system of a, dis of, of a decision um, is exemplified very well by the fact that um, in in the 1950s in Borneo, the World Health Organization was having problems with malaria. And malaria was being transmitted by mosquitoes. They figured, well, we'll just kill the mosquitoes with this very popular pesticide, DDT. DDT has a lot of, of ecological problems and, and human health problems, but they didn't really realize that at first. And they sprayed it willy-nilly. Um, and they discovered that um, when they did that, they had some uh, annoying side, side effects. For example, it killed the, the wasps that would lay their eggs on these caterpillars and, and devour these caterpillars. It's really very gross. Um, but those caterpillars would eat the, the, the thatched roofs off the, off the houses. And when those wasps got killed, the caterpillars ate up all the thatched roofs and they thought, oh, well, what the heck, we'll just replace them with metal roofs that the caterpillars won't eat. Well, that uh, made a real problem because it rains a lot in Borneo and it was very loud and people couldn't sleep, which was an annoying thing. But the really disastrous thing was that when you put in something like DDT, it not only kills the, the uh, mosquitoes, it, it also... In, it contaminates the beneficial insects. And, and so you can end up killing bugs that would, for example, like ladybugs, eat other bugs or like, you know, honeybees um, that would be pollinating. So you're losing those uh, ecosystem services by those beneficial insects. But you're also then putting that DDT 
up the food chain. Geckos ate bugs and the geckos got very high burdens of DDT in their systems, which the cats then ate and got very, very high levels of DDT in their systems and they did not do well with them. So um, when the cats died, then the um, mice and rat populations thrived, um, exploded, and they ended up with a typhus and sylvatic plague problem that they didn't have before. And so what the World Health Organization did was they teamed up with the Royal Air Force and they, did, they airlifted cats and dropped them in Borneo to eat the, the mice and the rats. And so that's a good example of they did not look at the system, they didn't look at the big picture. And as Garrett Hardin describes side effects, consequences you didn't think of, the existence of which you will deny for as long as possible. So, oh, there we go. Um, so the question is then, what do we need and how would nature do it? Nature has created products and processes over eons. Um, and so how, how do we look at those models for, to ad address the problems that we are, are grappling with? And so animals have evolved according to condi conditions over time. And whatever didn't work um, were, as, as uh, um, Amory Lovins would say, uh, recalled by the maker. They're now fossils. And what surrounds us um, succeeded. And so this is an example that I want to give you of biomimicry, which is this idea of mimicking biological processes and functions. So in Japan, when they introduced a new uh, bullet train, they discovered that when it came out of a tunnel, it created a sonic boom, which really annoyed the people around the tunnel. And so they, they called in the biologists and the engineers, and they thought about what functions in nature are similar to the functions of a, of a bullet train coming out of a tunnel. And they, and they looked to the kingfisher who can dive into a, bo a body of water after a fish and not create any waves. And so they remodeled the nose of that bullet train um, to mimic the, the beak of the, of the um, kingfisher. And what they discovered then was not only did the sonic boom go away, but the, the train was uh, much more efficient, more fuel efficient because it cut down on the wind resistance and it ended up going faster because it cut down on the wind resistance. So a good model um, in nature. So how would nature do things then? Nature sustains, it creates everything we need over time. Nature uses renewable energy it, and, it, and spills do not, um, spills do not uh, pollute the entire uh, Gulf of Mexico. And, and, and um, require us to uh, wash ducks with uh, detergent one by one. In nature, diversity is really important and it's, it adds beauty to things, but it also very, very importantly, creates resilience. It makes a system more uh, able to take an insult and bounce back afterwards. Nature uses life-friendly chemistry. So on your right, you've got the Kevlar bulletproof vest, which Kevlar uses very, very uh, caustic chemicals, toxic chemicals, and you have to boil those chemicals at very high temperature for a long time in order to make a, a Kevlar. On the other hand, a spider silk is stronger, a, sp a thread of silk, a spider silk is stronger than a thread of Kevlar, and yet, the uh, spiders do it at um, ambient temperature out of bugs. And nature adapts to the conditions. And so uh, this is a good example of an architecture that's, mimic, that's mimicking this termite mound in Africa where the termite mound, mound um, has these self-cooling uh, tunnely chimney kinds of things and it can maintain the temperature inside the nest to within one degree between day and night, even though the temperatures outside are swinging by 39 degrees centigrade. So 
uh, very, very impressive. And nature is constantly recycling everything with this cr uh, cycle of creation and destruction, creation and destruction, where uh, waste equals food. You know, like the log, the tree becomes a log, it breaks down, it becomes soil, it becomes another tree. And I wanted to just use this really good example of something that um, it's not a natural, it, it, it's, it's sort of mimicking a natural thing, but it's not something that we thought about when we made it. But they've been making glass out of sand for, you know, I don't even know how long, hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Glass is made out of sand. And when you throw it away um, and it breaks, it's inert. It doesn't poison anything. It doesn't, you know, choke fish. And, and as it gets smaller and smaller, it wears down with the other sand and you end up with these beautiful pieces of glass, which we used to always delight in finding on the beach. And eventually it will break down to be sand again. And that's not what we're using right now. Right now we're using mostly plastic and it does not do that. So it is not a good example of, of um, a biomimicry kind of pro product or even a good kind of product. And so uh, we need to remember when we're looking and we're thinking about how we can do things that doesn't, don't have these cascading effects, we need to think about the big picture and the system, but we also need to think about what's gonna happen over time to things. And that's the long view. And the Native Americans, um, starting with, you know, we know the, the most about it in the Iroquois because they had a constitution upon which we sort of based a lot of ours. But they said, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the ne next seven generations. And so the long view is very much about this intergenerational equity, and not only for the human generations, but for the generations of all living things. So, um, Thank you very much, and uh, I will pass it on. All right. That's my cue. <laughs> so I'm introducing Yuli. I'm the communications chair here at YWIB Seattle. My name's Mackenzie. Next up, we have Yuli Fuentes Medel. Um, she works at MIT um, with Sustainable Textiles, and she's the founder of D-Science, which she's going to tell you about today. So get ready to learn about some really cool fashion. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. So uh, before starting, I, I will share a secret. Um, I'm a scientist, but my background is actually neuroscience. I spent uh, many years uh, in the lab understanding the secrets uh, of what's going on inside the neurons of our brain. As Melissa said, it's, it's a system. So with that system, um, I have learned how to integrate that thinking and kind of ask one question at the time in when do you really need to analyze a system. But how else I was able to think about that? As a neuroscientist, I was always uh, asked this question. Hey, we have a left brain, a right brain, you can be analytical or you can be artistic. And as a neuroscientist, I can tell you right now that we have billions of neurons going from left to right and right to left, connecting our brain. So I, will, I was always backed by the idea that we just need to be one thing or the other. And to me, the, the, the best idea of intelligence, it's the quote from Einstein, creativity. And creativity from his mind was creativity is intelligence having fun. So he wasn't really choosing science. He was choosing to do something creative and fun. And today uh, you can see that a creativity has a multiple effect of outputs. Some people are the designers of the world, and you know examples of that. Some people are the engineers, they're making the machines, the computers. Some people are the scientists in the lab doing the experiments, and others are the artists. And all of them have a different type of creativity that gets put out in the world for the good of society. But today we're gonna talk about fashion. 
And fashion, it's all about design. It's a creativity that really tries to bring up the identity of human beings. Uh, and I will say uh, for the long history, fashion, at least for the woman fashion, has been trying to kind of accommodate happiness and confidence for the woman, right? But we don't think about science, fashion and science. But a couple of years ago, we have been starting to see a trend in the combination of what happened with fashion and science. And here are really three good examples. Number one, you can see those jackets. Uh, those were made by Susan Lee in Bio Couture, where she used bacteria, fermentation of bacteria, to create the material of that jacket. And that project is such a beautiful example of when you're using a scientific process like fermentation, that we use every day now to make beer, for example, makes a jacket that is as beautiful and fashionable for any person to use. The beauty of that jacket is that it disappears because it's also a natural resource. So it's a jacket that today doesn't even exist because it lasted a couple of uh, weeks and now you can just use another jacket. Other examples are like Francis who used cellular division to, ex to ex uh, create new mathematical algorithms and create different types of shoes, or the work of Lauren where she designed a textiles and mask that is able to capture CO2 and change color depending on how much CO2 is in the environment. So by combining fashion and biology in this case, you really can create a whole new type of fashion for the world. Another example is this mathematician, uh, Jessica, who created this company nervous system that by using algorithms in the computer simulation, she was able to create a one piece of dress just out of a 3D printing machine. So you can see here in the bottom, this 3D printed volume, that was exactly what this dress looks like when you take it out from a 3D printer, right? So technology and fashion has, has started to have a combination and now fashion is in the need of scientists in, in order to kind of transform what is going to be the future of this industry. So as I told you, creativity is an output. Back in a couple of years ago, I decided to combine the powers of design and science and I created a platform that was called the science. It took many uh, scientists uh, and designers to create this platform and it had the premise of understanding that the reality of the inventions out in the world is not uh, inventions that appear because uh, things are happening. You know, innovation happens because of people, because somebody thought about an idea and it's people who have these conversations that allow you to kind of create new things. So the hypothesis was, what if a designer like Einstein, and I mean like Yves Saint Laurent in this picture, and Einstein, a scientist, will be have a conversation together, and what if they have a conversation and they create something? What will happen? What will happen to the world? The truth is that we did that experiment. We created 61 teams with one scientist, one designer across the world, uh, 47 different cities. And uh, literally we created a new type of uh, community. We created the community of the scientists. This was the event, it was in 2014. Uh, 45 people uh, created different type of fashion. This was a fashion show. So imagine a fashion show organized by a neuroscientist. It, it was pretty hectic and pretty fun too. I'm gonna show you some examples of what happened when you put a scientist and a designer to work together. This was one of the, the beautiful examples. This is a dress that was created by a scientist uh, from UK and a designer from Pennsylvania. They, the scientist was studying the, the cancer of prostate cancer, and she was studying how do you test prostate cancer, uh, which is a, such a devastated disease. What the designer did was to use the mechanics of detecting cancer in order to create a whole new textile and a whole new uh, technique for creating new colors and pigments. So this dress was in the BBC News, everyone was kind of talking and thinking of a whole new language of how cancer now can be a beautiful thing. Uh, this dress, for example, is another one that happens uh, back in 2013 
Uh, it was a scientist that was inventing a different type of bacteria that will change color depending on the frequency of the light. Uh, this was a detection kit for cancer in the urine. So they were using bacteria to kind of shine light if they will detect a cancer cell. But what happened when they, the designer and the scientists got together is that they went to the lab and they invented a new dye where they now the textile, if it's exposed to UV light, is going to change color. So all those different shapes of colors are different type of bacteria that now are put in the dress. Now, this is really remarkable by, because it was happening in 2013. Today, we know that bacteria use a little amount of water in order to grow. So what will have happened in now, the amount of water that you use to create a dress is significantly less. And now you, in order to create one dress, you can use less amount of water really significant for our planet. The truth is that what we learned from the platform was that in order to combine the powers of design and science, we really needed to create a common language. So the idea of the, of, of the future of what's going to happen to science and design is that the words that are used in one field and the words that are used in the other field need to combine, but need to kind of create a new translation of how do we want to see the future of uh, design and science. Today we're talking about sustainability. And sustainability, I'm glad Melissa kind of gave you this uh, system approach and, and the, the idea that we need to start thinking about the planet as a system and for so many years, sustainability, particularly in the fashion industry, has been focused normally in the social issues that the industry has. There is a lot of problems with the workers and that, that we're doing a lot of work in, in Asian countries and India and how do we really treat our social workers. The other part has been the environmental cause. It takes tons of water to make one white t-shirt. So I think Amy will tell you more about that, but all the environmental uh, impact that making clothing has for the planet is tremendous. But my approach for sustainability has been, let's use the power of technology to solve what is gonna be the fashion of the future. If we were able to do in this experiment 45 cases where cancer science, bioscience, ocean science can start rethinking how we make our clothing, can you imagine what can happen with that? It's amazing. So the truth about textiles, and now everyone who is in the audience, I want you to touch the first piece of clothing that you are wearing. After we finish this talk, I want you to look at the tag and say, what is it made from? And you have to think that every piece of textile is a piece of technology. And the single unit of the system of a piece of textile is the fiber. The little threads that go around the, the, the fabric of your textile are the ones where you can really impact with technology in things that we make antibacterial, things that we made less waste, things that will protect us from the UV light. Everything gets made at the level of the fiber. So people today, and, and here is, is a picture of a professor, where are we gonna use the fashion of the future? So professors here in MIT, where, where I live, this is Stavan Newman designing the next generation of the spacesuit that is going to take us to Mars. So we do need scientists and designers to work in what is going to be the clothing that we're going to need for interstellar uh, travel, right? And in fact, the spacesuit has been uh, uh, changing constantly across the time that a uh, man has put their mind to go to space and being a collaboration between fashion and design. Today we're thinking about fibers and thinking about protecting us, the humans, and the health of us and the planet. And in order to create the fashion of the future, we really need to be thinking in how do we balance the two and how the things that you're wearing are going to be good both for us, the humans, and both for the planet. And the secret is in the atoms. 
uh, if you recognize this this picture is it's at the atomic level it's in the mo molecules that are making the fibers is in the materials that get made to make your sneaker your clothing your carpet textile touch life for every single person in the planet you are made of atoms so just think about 65 percent of you is oxygen so we are in this world and understanding this synchronic adaptation in how do we live in goodwill with the planet but at the same time we are exchanging atoms and we cannot invent atoms yet but that's what we're really doing and the truth for the fashion industry and this is to kind of give a, 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 a next for what amy is going to tell you is it's all about water how much water we use and how are we protecting our water because if we don't have water we don't have life so the exciting part for you guys is that the fashion of the future is going to look way more like this where scientists are going to be inventing the fermentation of the future and many other biological engineer computer science for the clothing that we're going to be using in the next century and what we need to do is to discover what are we going to do collaborating with many other fields to create that intersection that is going to create the intersection of the future so thank you so much that was me Thank you, Yuli. That was fascinating. All right. So next up, we have Amy Olson from the Seattle Aquarium. She's a research technician and laboratory specialist, and she's going to talk to us a little bit more about water and how that relates to sustainability and fast fashion and microplastics. Take it away, Amy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy. And I'm currently broadcasting from south of Seattle in Washington. Um, it's a beautiful day today. And I will be changing gears slightly and talking about our microplastic research project at the Seattle Aquarium. And then we're gonna circle back to fashion and steps that you can take individually to prevent pollution in the ocean. This is a part of our conservation research program at the aquarium. And if you're tuning in from outside of Washington, the Seattle Aquarium is located on the downtown Seattle waterfront. We are on top of two piers uh, just over Puget Sound. So we're literally right on top of the water. And we, most of our exhibits have animals that are found in our literally in the Puget Sound or off of Washington coastal waters. And I've posted some photos here of some of the more charismatic ones uh, and some of my favorites. So on the top right, we have the giant Pacific octopus. The bottom left is one of our rockfish species in Puget Sound. And on the bottom right are uh, four of our sea otters, Alaskan sea otters. Now there's been a lot of talk about systems and the ocean is a huge part of our ecosystem. Uh, the ocean covers over 70% of the earth's surface. And so as an aquarium, we wanna make sure that all of the work that we do falls into one of these three institutional initiatives that we've created. We wanna make sure that the work that we do falls either into or among multiples uh, climate resilience, which is ways in which that you can prevent big changes in climate change. Uh, we have sustainable seas, so this is making sure that we're not pulling out more resources than the ecosystem can provide or restoring areas and habitat to make it better for the animals that live there. And then finally, we have clean waters and the microplastic project falls into this category, clean waters. You might have heard about microplastics in the media. It's pretty well known. Um, you can see it in the news, in um, online. But if you're unaware or you haven't heard of it before or if you're unsure, NOAA defines microplastics as small pieces of plastic that are less than five millimeters long. 
and they can be harmful to our ocean and aquatic life. And so these little pieces of plastic come from all sorts of things that we use. So if you think of larger plastic products like water bottles or soda bottles, when they're out in the environment, the sun and UV light breaks them down, say they're in the ocean and they start breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces, so we get chunks. Yuli talked a lot about clothing and how it's made out of fibers. And a lot of these fibers will shed off of your clothing. I mean, you can see when you, you know, pull on your sweater, little hairs, little fibers come off. Um, nurdles are what a lot of news articles like to use in their photos of microplastics. So they look like little tiny beads that are the plastic pellets that the, the plastic industry uses to melt down and form new plastic things. And finally, we have personal hygiene product, products. So a lot of toothpaste and face wash used to have microbeads in it, and it was used as an exfoliant. So like when you wash your face, it helps to like take all the dead skin off. And so microbeads were made of plastic. And in the ocean, these plastics can be found pretty much all over from the surface, uh, where the lighter plastics tend to float. You can find it deeper in the water column, so the plastic will sink down into the water where the fish and other organisms are. And finally, a lot of plastic that is more dense or heavy falls to the seafloor. And it's been found in essentially every marine environment, even down in the Mariana Trench. And globally, these microplastics are coming from multiple sources. And 35% of this pie of where microplastics come from globally is from synthetic textiles, so those fibers. 28% come from car tires or car tire dust. So as your cars are driving along the road, the rubber that comes off of your tire as, as the, the friction of the tires moving along the road breaks off. 24% um, is in city dust. And this might sound kind of weird, but microplastics are so tiny and so light that they actually stick to dust particles and they can even float in the air. And so these microplastics that are either in the air or attached to dust can make it into the environment just from cities and people living in these big areas. A smaller percentage, 7%, come from um, road markings. And then we have 4% from marine coatings or the paint that they use on boats. We have 2% from personal care products and only 0.3% from plastic pellets. But the work that we do in the ocean, we find most of the plastic pieces that we see are fibers. So I know this is a really complicated graph, but we'll go through it from the left to the right. And if we start here on the left where the raw materials, so this is the materials, say fibers or plastic pieces that they're using to make a garment. And so this garment that you have in your closet, you wear it and when it gets dirty, you wash it. You know, you can keep reusing it. Maybe eventually you get some holes or tears that aren't repaired terrible and you throw it away or you recycle it and it kind of circles back into production. Some of the fibers that come off of your garment does go airborne and this makes it into the environment and there's really little you can do about that. Uh, when you wash it, um, little microfibers were, will come off in the washing machine just from the force of the machine moving around and the friction and this goes to the um, wastewater treatment plants so the same water that goes from your toilet, from your washing machine, goes there. And the effluent after it's been treated does go into the ocean or it goes into the sewage sludge. And all of these end up essentially in the ocean and in the ecosystem. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, some of the main sources we have here are either waste management, so you can see um, the this first picture here with the the dryer lint right here. We have dumping and littering, so you you I'm sure everyone has seen pollution and trash when you're driving around or walking around. And then we have a lot of storms here. We talked 
actually before this started about how it rains a lot here. And so this rain picks up things as the water, you know, starts pooling and little streams start going down into the ocean, it picks up all that trash and ends up in the ocean. And then another source in the Pacific Northwest is fishing gear that gets lost. And ecologically, what we're seeing for the bigger plastics are, you know, turtles and sea lions that get entangled or they eat the plastic thinking that it's food. You see the pollution. And then we talk a lot about how certain areas that get a lot of pollution, they get losses to tourism and their fisheries and maritime industries. But what we can't see, and Melissa talked a little bit about this in the beginning, is that a lot of toxic chemicals will actually absorb into these plastics. And when an animal thinks that this plastic is food and eats it, those toxic chemicals build up in their body and can be really bad for their health over time. So bringing it back to the aquarium, initially we started this project because we were concerned about the animals in our exhibits. We use water straight from Puget Sound. This is a picture of our intake pipes with a scuba diver, if you can squint right here. And so we're pulling up water all the time for our animals. And we wanted to make sure that our filter systems were really good at keeping out pollution and microplastics. So what we do in the lab is we collect water, we filter it onto a, a little filter paper that has this grid on it, we put it under a microscope and we zoom in, we use a camera to take photos, and we create a database with the size of the fiber, the color of the fiber, what we think it's made out of, and eventually, potentially, where it came from. And so some of our results in our past couple of years, we're really only finding one fiber per one liter of water. And one liter is about, you know, those, you got those big soda bottles, that's two liter bottle, I think. So if you think, okay, one fiber per bottle, that's really not that much. But if you think about the, the size of the ocean and how many liters make up the ocean, it really starts to add up. So the fibers that we're seeing are very small. So they're half a millimeter in size. And so I added this, this graph on the right. And so basically what we're looking at is something between the size of a human egg and a frog egg. So pretty, pretty tiny. Most of the colors that we're seeing are actually clear and blue. And these are the colors, blue is a common color if you think about your clothing. Blue is very common used in textiles and t-shirts, jeans, pants, what have you. Clear is an interesting one because clear tends to mostly be used in fishing gear. So we're curious to see where are these clear fibers coming from exactly. So for our project, what we're planning on doing is scaling up microplastics monitoring throughout the Puget Sound because we really care about the animals that live in the Puget Sound and off of the Washington coast. And we already do surveys of sea otters and rockfish in Washington. And so we're adding a microplastics component to see what those animals are exposed to. And we also wanna create a large scale picture of what's happening in Puget Sound. Now, if you're thinking, okay, this is really cool. I really like it, but what can I do about it? I see trash on the road, or I have these things in my closet, what can I do myself to make a difference? And if you live in Washington, there are many organizations that collect marine debris, they do beach cleanups, they uh, train community scientists or citizen scientists to help them with these projects. And so I would reach out to any of these organizations if you're interested in participating. But keep in mind that the plastic and pollution that we see in the environment has been estimated of only being 6% of all the pollution that's out there. 6% is pretty small. And I took these photos in two of our sites for our research projects. So the Washington coast is, um, brings up a lot of plastic just because of the waves and the tides and the gyres. And so here's a pile that people have started bringing up higher from the beach so that it doesn't go back down into the ocean. 
And then on the right, we do coral reef surveys in Hawaii. And so this is one of those sites that also faces the right direction and tends to accumulate a lot of trash. And so going out and picking up trash definitely will make a difference, but a lot of it is smaller than what you're seeing. So in doing some research on what individuals can do and what households can do, I found actually a few companies that have created really innovative products to keep microplastics out of the ocean. So the first one is Guppy Friend, and they made a microfiber bag that you put your clothes into, and then you wash, you put this in the washer and it washes it in your bag, and the bag traps the microfibers in it. A second one is the Cora Ball, and so this is a, a little ball that you put in the wash with your clothing, and the way that they've designed the little circular arms that come off of the ball also trap the fibers in that movement. And a lot of the messaging that we like to tell at the aquarium is you can also make other choices when you're eating and drinking, such as using compostable plates, cups, and silverware, you can recycle single-use plastics whenever possible. You can use a reusable water bottle instead of buying water. You can buy food and um, things uh, with less packaging, so buy things in bulk. Um, bring your own shopping bag is a really easy attainable one. And to avoid products that use micro beads in them. And so let's circle back to fashion again. As I was thinking about how microplastics and fashion fit together, I found that what one of the main concerns is the term fast fashion. And so this is clothing that moves really quickly from the catwalk to the store that you can go buy your clothes from. And so fast fashion um, allows people to buy those items really quickly for really cheap prices. And the material that this stuff is made out of is usually polyester. A lot of clothing is made out of polyester, which um, is really easy for people to work with, for companies to work with. They can make a lot of different collections and it's really cheap. But if you buy these cheap clothing items, I know I have in the past, the quality is pretty low and it tends to break down pretty quickly. And they've estimated that more than half of fast fashion items are disposed of within a year. There are some companies that are doing some really cool things with plastic though. So Adidas partnered with Parlay for the Oceans. And so the bottom left is a picture of shoes that are made with 95% ocean plastic that they recovered from near the Maldives which I thought was amazing. I mean, that's really cool to be wearing recycled plastic shoes. The bottom right is a resource that I recommend you to look into as well, Fashion Revolution. This is a campaign for clean, safe, fair, transparent, and accountable fashion industries. And so they've been doing a lot of work in making sure that the companies understand why this is important. But the main takeaway that I have for you all is make intentional choices when you're looking at clothing, when you're thinking about what your food comes in, really think about the little choices that you make and those will definitely add up. Any of the speakers are welcome to respond first. Yeah, I, I can take that or, or Melissa, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that um, I think one way that you need to think about it and um, back, this is going to sound stupid, but um, back when my, when I was younger and when my mother was young, um, the idea was to buy something that would last, to buy um, something that would be classic and, and reusable and um, a lot of fashion people who are not trying to just sell you more and more stuff will give you the same kind of advice buy buy basics buy um, staples and then add your add your um, you know your flair with the with the accessories so that's that's one thing is to think about um, buying buying less 
but make it buy it that it will last. Um, so it's about, once again, it's sort of about the system. How is your wardrobe and how are you going to do it within your budget and you get what you want? It is harder when you're outgrowing clothes, certainly. Yeah, I, I think my, my take um, for you to think about it is when companies are creating clothing, they're thinking in the consumer. So people like you, me, Amy, Melissa, uh, what we would like to buy. And, and something happened a couple of years ago, you might have done it in the paper, that fashion industry optimized by volume price, meaning selling a lot so they could sell for cheaper price and uh, satisfying a human behavior, which is curiosity. So you wanna activate more of the dopamine on changing identity quickly. Uh, so it's still science behind why we're buying so much clothing. So it took a behavioral neuroscientist to think about that and kind of come up with the best solution for creating this without really thinking back in the system and the planet. So what science is doing right now to rethink the sustainable textiles, and that's part of the work I do every day now, <laughs> is we're rethinking in the materials um, and rethinking in the manufacturing process. So if I can make, for example, uh, textiles that are made with the waste of the industry or waste from other systems, I'm utilizing and mimicking uh, the system of planet Earth and kind of rethinking the life cycle of how the products are going to be made. So cotton is one example. It can be recycled. You can bring it back. It's hard to remake the fiber. Even polyester, which is 63% of the market, it hasn't been sold for the microplastic effect that Amy told you about it. But there are companies, uh, particularly here in the United States, that are doing programs where you buy a shirt, you own it for a certain time, and then you bring it back, and then you get a coupon, and then that t-shirt is gonna make a new one. So then there is not everything thrown away in the garbage, but there is a responsibility and ownership of kind of your account of materials. Um, so, so people are thinking about it because they're not gonna change the behavior of you wanted to be curious or look differently because that's part of human nature. I, I do want to throw in that my, my daughter, um, my daughter does most of her shopping at the thrift store. I was going to chime in and say that. Hi guys, I'm Macy. I'm one of the committee members here for YWeb. Um, but I also just want to throw in that, um, Katie, I'm kind of in the same boat as you. It's like, I can't, afford to spend all this money on affordable clothing. But if you go to Goodwill, that's actually a way more sustainable than buying an expensive piece of clothing from one of those high end retailers. Um, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper <laughs> than they have, you know, you get the good brands sometimes. Um, so like I just got a new pair of Lululemon leggings. And while I don't support the brand, I wasn't increasing demand for them. Um, so while I'm not quite at the stage where I can increase demand for sustainable clothing brands, I can at least decrease demand for all the fast fashion companies. I was going to say the same thing. I second what Macy said. I also do some shopping at Value Village and Goodwill. And another way that you can get around this, Katie, is um, you can, you know how you wear something and say you love it for a while and then you get kind of tired of it. One way of kind of putting it back into the flow is donating it to those places, but also you can have clothing exchanges with your friends. And so they're probably similar size of you and you probably have similar styles. And my friends and I do that where, you know, you come up with a bag of stuff that you're like, oh, I just don't want to wear this anymore. And then you go through your friend's clothing. You're like, oh my God, I love this. I would totally wear it. And so you can do these kinds of exchanges that keep it in the circular loop instead of just discarding it. But I agree that a lot of these uh, sustainable products are super expensive and it's not accessible to most people. So I think it's definitely an issue. Thank you for that great discussion. I'm going to add one more 
to that. And it's using places online like ThreadUp where you can sell the clothes that you don't want as well. And then when you buy from them, it's all reused, sold from other people. So lots of different ways that you can sort of avoid that markup price, but still be shopping in a more sustainable way. Great question. Excellent question. When I was looking at the websites for both of those products, I was really curious about like how they work and whether or not they've actually had any kind of scientific evidence to show that their products worked or was it just a marketing gimmick? And both of them actually had some pretty convincing science that said that they did remove a portion of the microplastics that come off of your clothing. I think from what I, the top of my head, I think the Cora ball was 30%. So it's, it does some, but it doesn't do everything. And then both websites said, don't just rinse off your product because that's literally doing exactly what you just tried to stop doing. And they said to throw it in the trash, but that doesn't keep it out of the environment, right? I mean, you're just, you're putting it into the trash, with, which goes to the landfill, which ends up in the earth. So I think in, that's a good way. I mean, I live in Seattle. I own fleece clothing because I get really cold in the winter. I grew up in Hawaii. And so I, when I wash my fleece, you know, that's a good way to keep a lot of it. I just try not to wash it that often, which might sound kind of gross. <laughs> um, but I think if you can change what's in your closet instead of, you know, as you start to buy new things and as you, you know, change your style, try to buy things that are made with um, natural fibers like cotton, like Yuli said, and um, other fibers as much as you can, you know, within your limits. I actually, when you were talking about microfibers, I went and I grabbed my Cora ball because I just got it this week. <laughs> so we'll see how it works. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. Then you just throw it all in, in the trash. So we'll see. All right. Thank you for those thoughts. Are there any more questions? From I was in mute. Um, yeah, so uh, part of what's going on right now, it's, I'm, I'm not going to answer directly of the scale up because I do have some examples of technologies that right now are being invented for that problem. Uh, there are two ways to approach that. One is about chemistry and separation and the mechanicals of the, that separation. So there are companies today that are trying to take your clothing, but the problem is that when you make a shirt or a dress or something, it's a blend of fibers. It's polyester with a little bit of cotton or a little bit of uh, lycra because you want a stretchy and all that. So one of the fundamentals that have to happen for fiber is a little of the use of what I call the forensic science. We need to know where fibers are coming from so then you can keep track of the cycle of the fiber across the silts, the circle. Uh, so that's science that is needed in order to be reusing the material and kind of recycling the material in itself. And, and there are companies that are able to, for example, separate cotton from polyester. And that's a chemistry plus a mechanic. There are companies that are able to bring back the, the cotton in a way that is still useful to be spin and create a fiber. Um, there are companies that are using biotechnology in order to um, separate certain plastics and degrade them faster because you also could be uh, using the power of enzymatic uh, conditions to bring plastic in a different form that will uh, speed up the degradation. Okay. That's one type of science that is taking this. And, 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 and it's part of, I was in a conference last week and with most of the top experts of textiles. And one of them is somebody who's been inventing textiles for decades now. And he say, which was something really remarkable, we created this problem. So now we need to fix it. <laughs> uh, so that's why science is now into the kind of, let's fix it, but we can do it better. 
Uh, the other type of science is really exciting and is not scalable yet, but I think it will be really interesting to look at is uh, what a, a Melissa mentioned about the spider silk. Today we can take the synthetic, the DNA sequence of silk because it's a protein and genetically engineer the silk in order to make it a fiber that is biodegradable as any other sp spider silk in the planet. So we have now the ability to create spider silk, add uh, yarns and expand it to make a pretty, today pretty expensive clothing, but in the future it, it will be affordable and biodegradable. There is also biotechnology creating, cotton is a plant. So, and the cotton is actually the discard of the plant when they go in the cycle, right? So the, the cottony thing is, is part of the plant and the fibers that come out from the plant. There is plant biology that is thinking, how can you grow the cell of the cotton plant in the lab to have it grow in, in, in buildings instead to put it in the land and make the cotton grow. So now you can have cotton being grown in the lab instead to have it uh, being from the land and kind of do all the agricultural cycles that also are toxic for the planet because we won't have land for that much cotton if population keep increasing. Uh, so there are a bunch of efforts going on like now that will allow us to work with companies like H&M, Inditex, Caring, across all the spectrum to have fibers that will be invisible. At the end of the day, what has, has to, to happen to science in the fashion industry is science has to be invisible. And it has to be a mass that your fiber doesn't shred a microfiber. It has to be a mass that your clothing doesn't make you sick because we have no idea how much polyester make us sick. Uh, and I think nobody wants to do that study because we might not like the answer. Um, and we have people inventing electronics now in the clothing. So the wearable electronics of measuring your heart rate, they're mixing metals with uh, textiles, but we have no idea how we're gonna decompose and recycle those textile electronics. So uh, my work personally is to be ahead of the curve. And if we do want to invent that clothing that is potentially, for example, gonna help a paralytic person to walk back because now you have electrons activating your nervous system and we need that type of clothing, have the chemistry and the thinking of the circular economy of that product in place with science to scale it. Maybe that was a long answer, but, but that's what's going on right now. <laughs> That's fascinating. Thank you. Can I can I throw in a low tech op, uh, option too? Sure. Go ahead. And that is that um, I, I think that I think that legalizing the um, there are, there are options now for for growing hemp, and hemp is a, a very useful plant. It has a, it's got some great, very strong, very long fibers that are really, really useful for a lot of different things, as well as for oils and a lot of other products. Um, but it also has the advantage of using less water and and not needing the kind of pesticides that cotton do, does. And water and pesticides cost a lot of money, which makes more cotton more expensive. And so that's, that's one of the issues too. So I personally think that um, increasing the use of hemp for clothing and other textile uses is going to be really opening up uh, a lot of opportunity. Right. Thank Green you so clothes. much for that. Thank you, everyone. Once again, those talks were amazing, very eye-opening, and I hope everyone else felt the same as well. Thank you for those questions. And I'm looking at the time, I wanna respect everyone's evening. So I'm gonna let you all go, but thank you so much again for your time tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having thank us. You. Absolutely. And thank for all of the students watching, you can find our next event on our Instagram, YWeb Seattle.